Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? You might have to unmute yourself. Hey, David. Awesome. I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, Lisa, how you doing? All right, we'll get started in a minute here. Let's see who we got here. Dwayne, uh, where are you calling from? What city, what state? Chicago, Illinois? Awesome. Awesome. Lynn, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Maryland. Okay, cool. Are you currently wholesaling right now? No, just uh, in the very beginning stages. So been reading and doing some studies of rich dad, poor dad. So very, very beginning stages. Awesome. That's a good book. Yeah. So yeah, let, I want you to ask me some questions later. Okay. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Awesome. Lisa Simmons, how you doing? I see you're a rehabber, mentor, partner, and wholesaler. And Ms. Davis, how you doing? Hello, I'm doing well, and you? I am well, thank you. Where are you calling from, and are you wholesaling? From Connecticut, and yes, I'm a beginner. Awesome. I see um, Lisa put in the chat, she's um, a seasoned investor, and she's from Dallas. Awesome. I was in Dallas earlier this year. Great market, for sure. I had a deal in... Right in the, uh, I forget the name of the suburb. I'm sure you know it. Um, and Colette, where are you calling from? It Hello, a... I'm calling from Detroit. Oh, nice. Have you been on this before? Yes, last week. Oh, last week. Awesome. Yep. As you know, then I'm from Detroit also. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, so Lisa, you said you need to learn more about wholesaling um what is put in the chat like some questions you might want to know about wholesaling and your season uh, i'm taking it you do your rehabber you do you're doing some flips and are you buying from wholesalers are you buying on the market and just to you know i am just to let you know i do wholesale i got a a small team and that's the way I like it actually um I was doing it by myself for quite a while and I like it to, but I can't do everything myself so I think I lose more deals by doing it by myself because I can't get back to everybody um and things like that so what I'm doing now is I have two people that make phone calls um, and I have a virtual assistant out of the Philippines who also can make phone calls. Okay, just to give you an idea how my business is set up as a wholesaler, and it's not going to, every, every wholesaler has a different setup on their business. Some people like to build a big team. Um, some people do it themselves or one or two people. But the best way for me that I that I've come to and I've done it, I had a big team before. I don't like the um, responsibility of a huge team. I'd rather have a small team and I want, you know, my small team to make a lot of money, you know, and a lot of money is a diff is different for everybody. And so one of my guys might be happy with 60, 60 grand a year is life-changing for them, let's say. I'm just throwing that number out. The other guy might be 100 grand a year. So whatever their personal goal is, I mean, for one guy, I would like to, for him to make over 100 grand a year. And the guy that only wants to make 60, I would like him to make over 100 grand a year, okay? And what does that mean? If they're making a hundred grand a year plus each, that means I'm making a lot of money, <laughs> you know, because my callers might be set up. Sometimes it all depends on, you know, someone might get paid a weekly salary and then they might make 10 or 15% of a deal. Okay. Another guy might just be straight on commission and he might be making 20%. 
or, or even more than that, you know, just dependent 20 or 25% dependent on our setup and how much business we're doing and the responsibility and things like that. So, and I have a really good VA, he's making $8 an hour. And when we close deals, um, he'll get a, a bonus and $8 an hour in the Philippines is a lot of money. You could get VAs, I've had them before for $4 an hour. Um, it almost feels weird only paying them $4 an hour. Um, but this one, the reason I pay $8 an hour is he's more, um, he could actually make phone calls and lock up deals on the phone, you know, and, um, you know, so he, he's got, he, he's got some talent where I don't have to really babysit him and train him and things like that. So, um, I'm, not that I don't mind training him because we're always learning. I'm always learning. My guys are always learning. And so I realized that um, I, even if my guys, like people that are making phone calls for me, mess a deal up or anything like that, I don't get mad. I, I just want to bring it to their attention. And how can we learn from this? What do we do? What can we do next time and put a system in place? What can we do ne next time to avoid this? Or what do I need to teach them so they, you know, have the right tools and, you know, to get it right, you know? And, and when they make a mistake, what's the most important thing of wholesaling, in my mind, is knowing the after repair value of a property is very important. Um, I was... And Lisa, you probably would understand this and being a rehabber. Um, so I'm looking at a house to flip right now that I want. I'm flipping one house currently. If you go to my Facebook page, at the end, I'll put my information in there in my Facebook page. Um, you'll see my live videos. I did a walkthrough live video today, actually, of where we're at with the flip. But I want to flip two houses at once instead of just one at a time. I used to, I, I've done 12 at a time and it's way too much. Things fall through the cracks. It, it would probably be impossible for me to do 12 at a time now, or even more than two, just because of dealing with contractors and, and, and things like that is totally different than it was three or four years ago, um, in my opinion. Of course. But anyways, I'm looking for my next flip. I'm in the middle of one right now. We should be done October 15th. I'm pretty much got it sold already, which is great. So when we're done, we're writing a purchase agreement and and getting it. You know, we're going to start that process now so we could get it closed right away. Get the appraisal done as soon as we're done and things like that. So I got my price I want and I'm very excited about that. I don't even have to go through the pain of listing it. But long story short, um, I was looking at a flip yesterday and the, the market in Michigan here shows it's the ARV that after repair value, after it's fixed up really nice is three, 325, 350, or was this, let's just call it 325. So, but I'm looking in the future by the time I'm, I have this done, it's going to be winter time. The market in, in Michigan here is, a li is softening. Um, it's getting a little bit different. And, and um, so I can't really go off of these comps that happened four months ago, three or four months ago. I got to see what's going on right now. So I think my safe ARV is 300000 so there's a $25,000 difference. So I have to run my, I'm running my numbers off of 300. I could pick up this house for 170 right now. He was, he was asking 200. I got him down to 170, but really I got to be at 160 for it to make sense to me. Cause we got to put a lot of money into it. And so I'm just fighting him. I'm not going to waver. Um, um, I got to get it for 160 because Oh, so I'll just find another house. I get it. You sometimes you get attached and you really want to buy it and this and that, but I got to, that's why I got a partner in my flipping business so we could keep each other in check 
you know, I don't get all excited and say, I got to get it, or they don't get all excited and say, they got to get it. We kind of keep it, keep each other in check. So we just don't do something emotional and just buy it. And hopefully we can sell it for 320. The business uh, is, you can't base it on hopefully, you know, eight, nine, 10 months ago, you kind of could, because you could fix up a house and sell it and for a real top dollar and get some bunch of people paying over when the rates were low and everything else. But today you really can't. Um, do you get ARV from prop stream comps? I do not. Um, Dwayne, um, I get it right from the MLS because I'm a licensed real estate agent. I've been licensed since 2012 and that's where you get the best. Um, but prop stream I hear is decent. Um, and Privy, P-R-I-V-Y is a new one. If you ever heard of that one, that's going to be, that's really kind of replacing prop stream. You get more information, you get more comps and all that good stuff. It works really well, Lisa, in Dallas, the Privy does. I'm not sure, you, are you, um, I know you say you don't usually buy from wholesalers. There's a lot of wholesalers in the Dallas market because um, I get the, because I'm, I'm trying to open up a little bit more and do some more virtual wholesaling in Dallas. And I've been, um, I have some boots on the ground there. So there's, um, you might want to get on their list. Maybe you get a deal when you're ready to look for a deal. Um, it might be a good, a good way of doing it. Um, if you're looking for more deals, I found a deal on the MLS today that was bank owned. That is, you know, I'm looking, I'm going to look at it. They want 110,000. And if I get it for just from a quick, if I get it for a hundred and put 60 grand into it, that's what I'm thinking it's going to need just by looking at everything. Hopefully not as much, but I'm kind of figuring high. If I put 60 grand into it, I could sell it um, for 240, 235, 240 and make a $60,000 profit. So I'm looking at that, um, that's another one. So I do check the MLS, that's a really good way of looking at it. Oh, you generate your own leads, that's the best. So that's why you need to wholesale Lisa because you probably can only buy so many at one time. So you, that's kind of what I do is I generate my own leads. I keep the great ones for myself and and um, and I wholesale the other ones um, in your license in Texas. That's awesome. If um, what, so you generate your own leads to do your flipping. That's what I'm understanding. Oh, can you hear me now, Lisa? I can, sorry, I had to take a call from a seller. <laughs> Speaking of, I'm, I'm sorry, from a buyer. Speaking of wholesaling, I was, I'm working on, uh, five acres um, in Dallas that uh, is a little complicated because it's residential, but it needs to be subdivided into about 23 to 27 lots. And um, anyway, my seller, I'm sorry, my buyer called me. So it's been a, it's a little crazy since 630. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So that one that you, are you going to develop that for yourself or? No, your no, I, I'm not a developer, mm -hmm. but I did find a developer builder. He's both that uh, is going to buy it. And that's what he was telling me. He, he wants to go to the city tomorrow and get it zoned. And he wanted to make sure that was okay with me, which of course it is. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Maybe you could um sell the houses for him right as a real estate agent if you do it for that you know what i mean well he um uh, as an agent i i've never shown a house to a buyer uh mm -hmm. and i've only listed three houses for sellers only because yeah. they called me to buy it and it wasn't a deal you know so sure. it wasn't going to be profitable for me but my license uh probably like you um in some ways uh has uh 
been so I could make really good educated decisions yeah when I buy and then when I sell so I do list my own houses and um I love having my license don't you I mean I don't know how people yeah. I don't know how they do it without it going I know it's yeah stream or going off of Zillow and things like that yeah it, it is it tougher it makes it tougher for sure the courses is probably a lot pretty tough for a lot of people and who likes to study and take tests you know to get your license yeah. but um i do i really do enjoy my license i think it's helped me tremendously absolutely 100 percent. and so i i actually got three five three lots i just purchased today actually in florida um punta gorda i think it's called punta gorda and and we are hooked up with a developer down there a guy from Florida that's from here brought it to me and he we got a great deal on the lots we got them for less than I think 12 grand one one 12 grand on another and 13 on the other and these lots have already been approved for for building up to five units on each lot oh my goodness exactly so we got plans already drawn up, drawn up from the builder and um, there's someone else involved and they built where they could build, they were gonna build three, three units. And then we had two, we got two other lots under contract. We haven't closed on them yet in the same, same area. And there's waters right there. It's a really good area. And um, in one of the places, one of the lot, the one lot we passed on, you, it was approved for eight units, but, or up to 10 units, excuse me, we're gonna build eight units there, but the electric going to it was on the other side of the road and across a main street. It just seemed too risky in my opinion. Yeah. So, um, think we might go back and buy it after they build it I mean why not buy it and build a dog park on it if it's so cheap or something you know something creative like that or a parking lot or I don't know but um so we're getting the other two lots so I, I said look the more units we could build maybe not five units but let's build them like four units each instead of three you just added another unit so we're going out there we're going to put this on the market and I know a bunch of people that might be interested in this, that, you know, they could go and get a loan or go pull some money together and, and only put 20% down and, and have 16 units built brand new. And um, the builder's in place to build, he's ready to go. And, and, and you know, so that's our, that's our main goal is to do it that way and see how it works I mean, it's my first time ever even venturing in something like this i'm really in my mind i'm not really doing anything at this point i'm just gonna start talking to people about it we got an agent down there they're gonna put it on the mls and so they kind of seem a little experienced in this so just hoping knock on wood it works out worst case scenario i'll just have to sell the lots and sell them for more and pay my private lender back. And I learned a lot, you know, but I, I got a pretty good feeling about it. Even in this market where things are shifting a little bit, um, especially in Florida, because there's a lot of people are moving to Texas from, or Texas and Arizona from Florida, because there's just the housing situation is kind of weird there from what I understand. So they need some more housing over there. Yes, uh, there was a uh, house that I renovated uh in fort worth which is a large it's right beside dallas but it's kind of a cow town sort of place it's yeah typically not the more sophisticated parts of dallas that you would see so it's it wants fort worth wants to be dallas but it's not quite yet anyway i i um renovated a house that I sold for a half a million there and my buyers were from Florida and their house in Florida was half the size of mine. Mine was 4,500 square feet and theirs was about 2,100 square feet. 
they had theirs listed for $999,000 and mine was 500,000. Yeah. Wow. And behind my house were high voltage power lines, which is not what anybody wants. So the local people would walk in and see these high voltage power lines and go, no, 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 not even looking at the bedrooms. Right. But the buyer from Florida, and they actually flew in from Florida, they were so enamored over getting twice the house. And it was a spectacular home. If I could have put this house in like North Dallas, it would have sold for probably close to a million. Wow. But Fort Worth just doesn't draw that kind of price. But, oh, it was a beautiful, beautiful home. Yeah. But for them, the high voltage power lines didn't really matter because they were getting twice the house for half the price. Right. So that was that was really interesting. That's when I learned when we have kind of quirky houses that the locals won't look at. Uh, some of the out-of-state people are willing to overlook some of these interesting characteristics sure yeah i was trying to find that one in dallas that i had i, I know you know the city like just cannot seem to find it but anyway yeah so yeah, that's interesting yeah so those yeah so i'm just hoping that you know i'd like to do more out of like i'd like to do wholesaling in dallas virtually from here well um, i'm happy to to help you yeah not that you need my help of course no, sure. no. <laughs> i mean i'm on your webinar so i can learn <laughs> no, but i, I could probably be some boots for you yeah 100 percent. yeah i love that and um, since you talked about lots do you mind if i share a little example that um was a surprise for me but it might yeah. be helpful to for some sure. of the folks Please. so uh a seller had a burned house this was an old house and it wasn't burned terribly the um there had been a fire in the utility room caused by the dryer and so it had just burned that little room it didn't go through the roof or an outer wall or anything like that mm -hmm. but it was in a really uh really um interesting part of dallas where millions and millions of dollars are being put into new developments in like just a few little streets like eight streets just a little tiny neighborhood in dallas a lot of old old houses so my and this was a wholesaling um i i'm actually kind of proud of of this so that's why i wanted to share it for the benefit <laughs> of others um i had to look who my buyer was going to be and my buyer could either be a rehabber or my buyer could be a kind of a builder developer so i googled and i drove around using the cursor on google looking at the streets and what i noticed was one street over houses were being torn down and then condos were being built in their place nice and so i didn't know i you know it was just one of those things where running comps was i don't know it was just it was kind of this one was was one of those throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks and so on a whim i decided to and i got it under contract for two hundred and thirty five thousand. On a whim, I decided to market it for three hundred and fifty thousand. Nice. Well, the first the first offer I got was two hundred and forty five thousand dollars from a rehabber, because a rehabber, you know, has we have to make our money when we sell, so we have to buy really low. Mm -hmm. At that meant I was going to make ten thousand dollars, which you know nobody's going to look away at that but i thought there was more money there so i started calling the builder developers in the area that had built the condos and what they were doing was they were scraping the house and building four condos on right. one lot two on the bottom two on the top and then selling the condos so the rest of the story is 
this one builder said, yes, I want it. Uh, I'll pay you three ten. Well, three hundred and ten thousand was a great price, but I'm a little competitive. So I wanted to see if I could get more. So I said, well, you know, I do have another offer. Of course, he didn't need to know it was only two hundred and forty five thousand. But I said, I've got another offer. And so if you want this lot, you know, this property, you need to, you know, come up to either 320 or 330. Well, I knew it was going to say 320, of course. So I said, okay, 320. Right. And so uh, that's, that's what uh, it went for was 320. And his plans were to scrape the house and build four condos on there and i ran comps on the condos that had sold they had been selling for an average of seven hundred and fifty thousand nice. dollars each four mm -hmm. on one lot Three so meals. he was this extra ten thousand dollars was no big deal to him and so he basically was investing three hundred and twenty thousand dollars to build 2.8 million dollars worth of right houses so that that's a story for everyone that decides to work with lots or a burnt house uh, yeah. it was a serendipitous um uh, experience for me yeah awesome it's and obviously different. selling to a developer was far more than the ten thousand dollars that it would may have made exactly. selling to the rehabber yeah hundred percent hundred percent yeah, that's a that's one thing that you did is even if they even if you're making twenty or thirty thousand, or even if he was giving you the you know, you always kind of do what you just did there in wholesaling or anywhere in any type of business, and you always you know I do like you said I do have another offer, and if you could come up you know you gave them a price range and you you always tell them the price range what what you kind of want and you go a little higher than that because they're always going to come where you want and um it's and if he said no you know how to turn it to take the 310 right i mean you can always go back down as needed you just don't have to be so excited in the beginning and or or, or the conversation or you know you go always you know that that was a good point there just like i do when um when i'm i always when i always like my sellers and i'm let's say they want 100 grand for a house and even if the 100 makes sense i said you know i might i might give them a little story and then i might tell them you know for this to make sense for me um I got to be closer to 85,000, 90,000, right in that ballpark. Would that be something you might consider? And boom, they, you know, you get to feel them out. I could always go back. It's not like I said, you know, 90,000 is the best I could do, take it or leave it type of deal, you know? And um, so, yeah, you just don't know what someone else is thinking on the other end. You got to try to fish it out. And just the same thing, if I go to a house and someone wants 50 grand for the house, I might look at them and shake my head, make a couple noises and say, oh, that, I was thinking half that. I've done that. I do that every time. I was thinking half that. <laughs> and, and then, and I keep my mouth shut from there. It gets a little uncomfortable and I want to see what they say. And eventually they're going to either say I'm crazy or they might start talking and I could hear how they, you know, I can't do 25,000, but I could do 30 or I could do 40 or something. I just saved, made some extra money at that point, you know? Um, yes. You know, uh, what I, the other thing that I noticed to your point is that when I went up 10,000 in my conversation with the developer, I mean, he maybe took a half a breath and went, okay. But if I would have gone to the rehabber and said, you know, you're offering 245, I really need 255, that would, that might have priced them out of being able to sure. make profit. Yeah, I, I got you there. But 
that makes complete sense because usually when um did you have a like a rehabber i would already have like a price when i list my prices of what i want for my houses that's what i want i'm not really trying to get people to fight and i try to get I, I don't know some people do it that way and they try to get the highest and best and and try to get a bunch of people there no if i want twenty thousand for a house and you offer 20 I'm going to sign a contract pretty as quickly as I can. The only time I, if I have multiple offers, now I'm going to go with the best, um, who could close the fastest, who's not going to be a headache. You know, if someone says, well, I need four weeks to close. And then someone else said I could close in three days or two weeks or two weeks. I'm going to go with the two weeks instead of the four weeks. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting that price, I want it one anyway. Um, that's usually how I do it personally. It's not right or wrong if someone does it the other way, but, um, when I have a bunch of buyers I'm dealing with, usually I know them and I don't like having my good buyers fighting over each other. Cause I'm going to have, if I have 10 people that are interested in it, nine people are not going to be happy. So I kind of got to, um, I don't really. I do pitch deals out to my whole buyers list, but a lot of times I pick up the phone. Like today, before before the phone call here, um, I have a, it was funny, it's a firehouse. Um, Colette, you probably know the area, Wayne, Wayne, Michigan. And I got it for $5,000. And the fire is even not that bad. And... Um, the house is probably a hundred and fifty thousand dollar home. My words. Right. The guy got his insurance money. He's an elderly guy. He wants to get back to Florida. Him and his wife, real nice guy. And he and they have a third. He already got most of his insurance money, and they got a thirteen thousand dollar bond being held with the city. He wants that money back. So really, in his mind, he's going to get eight thirteen plus five thousand. We just got this deal on the contract this morning. And he goes, if you could close it by Monday, I'll even sell it to you for $4,000. Oh, my word. I know. So I call, I, I just texted like four people. Two people said, no, I'm not interested. I, I, I'm like, are you guys crazy? But, and then two other people said they're interested. I said, well, I'm going to be showing it today. I set it up for one o'clock. I went there and one of them could not make it. Okay. Real nice lady. I sold her a firehouse in Detroit. She did wonderful on it. And I, I knew I could have, I could have probably sold this house for 20 or 25,000, but the time factor was I wanted to make, I want to close it fast for him. Right. And and I didn't want it to drag on and everything else. I really, I really wanted to close it fast. Now, if I couldn't close it this week or, or Tuesday, then I would I would pitch it out. I'll have more time because he's going to Florida Tuesday. So I want to close it before he goes to Florida. If he does it, let's say I couldn't get a deal done before then, um, then I would pitch it out at a higher price. But I'm, I'm still happy. I, I, I'm a deal junkie. I like closing deals and doing deals. And I don't really, you know. So long story short, my guy who looked at it, he just called me and says he'll take it. I said, I already had him. He goes, we can, I just got a text that says, I don't know, let me put it on my screen. It's so funny. We're talking about it and he just texted me. Let me show you. He goes, because I asked him and he said he could, but he just now confirm and it says it says on there we can close i can't let's see we can close tuesday you see that so he, he's he's gonna we're gonna get it done so but um i know i'm rambling because i don't remember exactly why <laughs> but this is this is part of the day today and um i know Dwayne du mcgee you put a comment in there is this a good time to get into wholesaling? Hundred percent, man. It, it's probably better than it was eight, nine, ten months ago. 
things are changing and it's going to be better for wholesalers. I like it in any market. I don't care if it's a buyer's market, seller's market, if the market crashes, really if the market crashes, it's even easier, but I like it in any market. So definitely it's a good time to get into wholesaling. Um, I do have a mentoring program for wholesaling and I'll kind of give you guys the reason why. Um, I don't think I told anyone. I might have mentioned it last time. I just started it, had my first thing. The reason why I started a mentoring program is locally here, I might get five, six DMs, text messages, um, phone calls every day of new wholesalers that want to learn how to wholesale or they want to take me to call they want to you know go to coffee or take me to lunch or dinner or drinks and things like that and i want to help everybody i want to give them all the information um and things like that but i just don't so if i have 20 people that reach out to me in a week and i might have talked to two three or four people and then the other people it just makes i think it makes me look bad not being able to talk to everybody so i said you know what I'm going to kind of give back, but because a lot of people I do talk to uh, say, well, meet me here and they don't show up or, or do this or do that. This is what you should do. And I never hear from them again. So, uh, so I figure if someone's paying and the, uh, the amount is $400 a month, that's what my mentoring program is. And, and then I could give back and put my time into people that are paying. Cause I guess I'm figuring if you're paying, you're gonna be serious about it. And um, cause one guy, I, I did a speaking engagement yesterday talking about wholesaling. And the guy reached out to me that morning, yesterday morning, I said, all right, I'm gonna be, I'm speaking at this time, this and that, I never heard from him. You know, <laughs> he didn't even say, oh, I can't make it. I got class or this or that. He just never reached back out. So, but, um, but yeah, so. Getting in, not saying to join my mentoring. That, that's not what I was trying to say. I'm just saying I think it's a great time to get into wholesaling. Um, going to meetups is really important. I did that in the beginning. I just been wholesaling six years. January first coming up will be my six year wholesaling. I have before that I never even heard of what wholesaling was, and once I heard about it, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was illegal. I said, this has got to be a joke. It doesn't make, you know, it made sense, but it didn't make sense. And, and I actually love it, you know? So I really like it. It's a full-time job for me. You know, it's not passive at all. It's work and rentals is not passive either, but it's more passive than, you know, than wholesaling. You know, my opinion on rentals and I want to own a bunch of them but it's not, you're not gonna get rich quick. You're gonna get some cash flow. But once you gotta put a roof on a house, you just lost your cash flow for a year or two right then and there. It's great to have a bunch of rentals so you could get the tax benefits. There's a lot of good reasons to have rental properties, in my opinion. As you know, Lisa, flipping, it's a lot, big taxes and things like that. Wholesaling, big taxes, you know, so. We always got to find ways. That's a business in itself. How can you um, not pay taxes legally, you know, and you got to have a good team around you to tell you what you got to do and how you got to set yourself up, what you got to buy and things like that. Um, do you know, one thing that I uh, actually didn't start wholesaling consistently until about six months into COVID in 2020, uh, because a lot of the contractors were kind of scared to go out and about, even though they still needed to feed their families. So I thought, you know, I, I renovated my last house, finished it, sold it. And I thought, okay, let me figure out how to, how to wholesale. And I kind of did a kind of a self-taught crash course you know and fortunately because of me buying properties to renovate i just needed to change the exit strategy because the process was very much the same i i've always thought that a wholesaler needs to know everything that a 
rehabber does, maybe not all the details of renovating, uh, of, of uh, uh, estimating cost, but the wholesaler just doesn't sling the hammer, mm -hmm. you know, but the whole process of coming to the decision if this can be profitable at the end of the rehab when it's sold is the same for a rehabber and a wholesaler. And so that's really when my wholesaling began and I've kind of moved into more lots because mm -hmm. you don't have to, they're just, you know, you just call up somebody and say, go drive by and tell me what you think, you know, yep. instead of, um, going to yeah. the house or putting a lockbox and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Um, definitely right now in Michigan, I'm feeling what it, you were feeling in 2020 or when, when COVID hit because the rates went up, people think to think the crash is going to happen. I got more buyers that are scared to buy right now, unless it's just like a no brainer type deal. But because the market, you know, once you fix a house and you put it on the market, um, it, it, it's been sitting because they want top dollar and things like that. So when I do my flips now and the one I'm doing right now, I got it so cheap. And, and even if I sell it for 200 or 250, I'm going to make a lot of money either way. So I'm, so I just figured, look, worst comes to worst. I sell it for less and I still make a lot of money and get, go buy another one at a good price. So um, the one thing about wholesalers about when I pitch out a deal, I, use, I don't put in my, my, when I pitch it out to the world or when I'm talking to um, the buyers, my rehab, the rehab costs. I never give a sell or excuse me, a buyer the rehab cost because it is so different between it all depends on who's doing the rehab, you know, because it could be someone that does the work themselves as buying it and they they someone that has a great team and they get great prices or it could be a big company that has that does a lot of flips and they have in-house people that do, do work for them or another company that pays way too much. And for them, it's going to cost them a hundred grand to fix it. Another guy, it's going to be 60 grand. That's a big difference there. So I usually don't, I just tell them what's wrong with the house, what it needs. I try to do some video, video walkthrough. And I do some, a lot of pictures, a hundred pictures. And that's pretty much it. I don't really give them comps or anything like that. I let them do, you know, I used to do it. But I realized that, you know, no matter what, you know, if you give them an ARV and things like that, they're just going to argue with they, they or they're just that they're just going to use it against you when they try to come back to you. You know, in my opinion, that's my experience. So I usually don't worry about that. I just I kind of know what, what I'm thinking in my head and and I get I try to lock it up as cheap as possible and put it out there, what I think is a great deal. Cause the faster I could close that or sell that deal, the faster the seller's happier, I'm happier and I could keep moving on to the next one. So that's kind of like, you know, I do it. I'm more of like, give me a bunch of five, $10,000 deals instead of one or two, 20 or $30,000 deals all day long, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, I would agree with you wholeheartedly because I think there's a lot more buyers at the lower price points. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have a buyer's list. I've never developed that um, like you have, but, um, but that does make so much sense what you just said. Um, a quick question that I have, this is a situation that I have right now. Mm -hmm. Someone brought me a lead they don't really know what to do with it, but it's in a very rural area and it's a house on an acre amongst a lot of mobile homes. And we're talking gravel road. <laughs> so that sets the scene for this is really in the country uh, and an unincorporated area. So it's not city where there's code compliance. 
Um, and there, I, I was running comps last night. There is absolutely nothing, not even close. The, um, this house was built in, in 1970 and uh, probably eight out of the 10 solds in the last two years. I went back that far. I was so desperate to find solds. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of them are houses that are 20 to 25 years newer. They were built in the nineties. And I, I have no earthly idea. I, I didn't know if maybe you had some Intel on how do you pick out the spaghetti noodles to throw against the wall to figure out <laughs> what to offer, what to sell it for? <laughs> well, a couple things. One, one thing I do a lot, because you're not sure what the ARV is, obviously, it sounds like, um, but you can figure out what it needs work-wise. Ask the seller, if you haven't already, say, you know, ma'am or sir, you know, if you fix this house up and it was beautiful, like HGTV and everything you would have done to the house, open concept, everything, granite or quartz or whatever the area, you know, it just looks beautiful. What do you think the house would sell for? Okay. And I do that even if I know what the ARV is, because if you know the ARV is 400,000, not this particular house, but any house, you know it's 400 and they give you a number of 350, you could just look at them and say, you know, I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking, you know, probably around 350, 355, somewhere in that area. You just made $50,000, $45,000 because now you could go to them and say, so this is what I would have to do. You know, you know, I got to put a kitchen. What do you think the kitchen is going to cost? $15,000, you know, or 10, whatever they say. And then what do you think a roof's going to cost? And let's say the roof's 10 and they say 15. You could use that number or you could say, you know, I could probably, you know, I've been doing it a while. I think my guy would probably do it for 12. And you just start saying everything you're going to do to the house and how much it's going to cost you before you know it. Now you back it up. So if I could sell this for 350 after real estate commissions, after this, after holding costs, oh yeah, I forgot about holding costs and all these repairs I got to do to the house. I got to make a little bit of money. You know, I don't work for free and you put your money, your profit in there and you get to a number that makes sense and you kind of show it to them and say, I got to be at 125,000 just to make $19,000 or something like that, you know, but really you're going to make 50 more, you know, cause you already know the ARVs are higher, but um, on the one that you're talking about, have you talked to, do you have any appraisers that you could go to and kind of give them the scenario? Maybe they could do something different, like a quick, I know you got the MLS access and things like that, or maybe they could give you some ideas of how they might say, you know what I would do? I would go out. Um, I would go out um, um, a mile or two miles or a mile and a half or do this, or I would use a different, I would adjust it for a newer house by $20,000 or 15 or 10, you know, maybe something like that might be an idea. Yes, that's a great idea. Um, this is such a little rural area. I did not go by subdivision. I did not go by zip code. I went by city. <laughs> oh, I see. I got it's you. That Understood. rural. And in the yeah. whole city, which I guess it's a town because it's not incorporated, it is a city. But um, in the last two years, there were 10 sales 10 houses sold again yeah. entire a, i would i would definitely get a couple opinions or a few opinions from an appraiser maybe your broker has a connection or a title company or a mortgage company i'm sure they have some connections to some friendly appraisers that might look at that for you and maybe get two or three different opinions so you might learn a little bit from each one 
Oh, that's a great idea. I hadn't thought about an appraiser. I think there's two kinds of appraisals. Um, I had a hard money lender a few years ago and, you know, they do their full appraisal, but then for one of my friends, this same appraiser, that's also a hard money lender did a, um, I can't remember what it's called, like a street appraisal or something. It's like a desk appraisal. Yeah, they call it, I call it a drive-by appraisal. Drive-by? 